We know it is that time. It's the 3.30 hour when the slump is really starting. Um, but I'm very excited about this next session. So out of the last couple of um, Humanists at Work workshops and in my conversations with graduate students, and I should say um, in conversations that our partners around the nation have had with their graduate students, the issue of mental health is something that's on all of our minds. Um, and as we were thinking about the, session, the workshop today, we really wanted to have a, a, a session around mental health. Um, and through some students at UCLA, I met Lori Mattinson, who is a lecturer with the writing programs at UCLA, um, and learned a bit about her work around mindfulness and writing, um, and thought that, again, in the spirit of experimentation, we would invite Lori to come and chat with us about this. Lori, thank you. Thank you so much. Are we on? Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, I'm so excited to be here and also very excited for your renewed enthusiasm for the afternoon session, which can be nap time for some of us. So um, thanks for sticking it through. And, you know, I just would like to say on a, on a personal note, um, don't underestimate the power of this right here, exactly what we're doing right now, which is spending the day with smart, thoughtful, like-minded people who inspire the right things in you, right? And I will tell you that for me, these kinds of experiences, and this today even, will manifest for me in my career in some way. You know, I will end up writing an article about the value of inner work or the value of diversity in community or something. And so I'm hoping that what I can bring to you will also plant some of those seeds that will manifest for you at a later date as well. Um, I will just let you know first, there's a handout on your tables in the center. I got to most of them. There's maybe one table that doesn't have full, is that you guys? So the people who have extra handouts, maybe you can pass them down this way. Um, that would be great. And here are just some extra resources that I recommend. Okay, so if you wanna just take a fast look at it, and here are my disclaimers. There's a few on here that I highly recommend and a few on here that were recommended to me. And so like the, the texts at the bottom, the two texts, uh, the last entries were recommended to me, so I cannot personally vouch for those, but I thought I would pass along the information. Um, others of you have heard about the website called The Versatile PhD. Uh, I'm not personally on it, but I thought to include it since many of you told me you found it useful. The other ones, though, I really do recommend. The first one there that talks about um, the work of Parker Palmer, I highly recommend. And it really is some of my work that I've done with him. He's a very special person at the Fetzer Institute that I'm going to bring to you today. Uh, and also the op-ed project is an amazing, amazing um, program. They do media training and they can also help you get really in touch with what your sense of leadership is around various issues and maybe how to translate that to other communities, other publications outside of the academic world. Um, and the other one is the UCLA Mark site, which offers all kinds of free mindfulness um, training sessions and videos and extra tips. So I do recommend those three. And anything I'm going to say today, if it resonates with you or even if you remain unconvinced, I'm still happy to be in conversation with you about it. That's great. Um, if you want to check out the websites that I recommended there and then contact me if you have further questions, happy to do it. Okay, so that's that. Oh, oh and by the way, the, the little book called Let Your Life Speak is this book by Parker Palmer. I love this book. He talks about the idea of vocation rather than, a, not so much as a goal you pursue, but a calling you listen for. And just being quiet and listening for your calling and activating those things. And I, for me, that's made all the difference. Okay, so I would like to begin with several minutes, just my own sort of mini story from the field, just to get a sense of who is talking to you today and why I value what I value. Um, I have been teaching writing at UCLA as a lecturer for over 20 years now, but I also have a very active creative life outside the academy, and so I feel very satisfied with the way that I've been able to bridge work inside the academy and outside. And I was really shocked at the last presentation when Annie asked you guys, what are some of your unexpressed values, right? Things that you truly value but are not being expressed fully. The majority of the room raised their hand for creativity. <laughs> I thought, wow. This is an incredibly creative group, and yet we're not truly activating that part of ourselves. So I'm gonna share with you just a couple highlights from my own career path that I feel like might boost those things in you, give you, you know, it's, it's a kind of, this is what worked for me, maybe it'll inspire you. 
Uh, so the first thing I did is, when I was in graduate school, I was frustrated. <laughs> I left the country, I took a leave of absence and moved to Jerusalem just for fun. My advisor and everyone said, what are you doing? You're getting off your career track, <laughs> you're crazy. I said, I have to just do it for me. And then I also started looking at what was missing in our world, because at the Beit Midrash, or the schools I studied in in Jerusalem, that's the word for library, um, something's wrong if it's quiet in the room. Right? The whole point is you, you, you sit between you and a partner, you stick a book between you, and you argue over it for 10 hours a day for fun, not for any credit for anything. Okay? I couldn't get enough of it. And it was the most alive, engaged, pedagogical experience I had had, uh, and I wanted to bring that back with me to UCLA. Um, but instead, I found this great disconnect between, I, I don't know if you, you know, look at the lectern, right? I felt like, Here's a whole group of people who exist from the neck up. Like, we exist from here up. And I started feeling like, where is my body? Where are my feet on the ground? Where is my belly? You know, where is my breath? I felt really disconnected from the rest of me. And so I started searching for, well, I'm searching for the body. So at the time, my sister was a doula, which if you don't know, uh, is a midwife, so she helped people through labor and delivery. And I was jealous because I felt like she gets to help deliver babies and there's something so real about that experience. And even though I do believe that the world of ideas is a very real world and everything we create in the world starts from there, right? Um, I still felt like my theoretical life as a graduate student um, first just felt alone and, and also not real enough. So I decided to take a um, yoga teacher training course, not to be a yoga teacher, but just to have a different educational experience and more to sort of protect the longevity of my own practice. Uh, and then I decided to do a certification in massage therapy, also just for a different education. But then I felt like I'm living in two different worlds. I have this very embodied, wonderful world over here and then this world of ideas over here. And for me, one of the most satisfying things for me personally and professionally is the notion of synthesis because I have a highly chaotic, neurotic mind, <laughs> as many of you do, too. I know some of you are my people out here, okay? And so, also self-critical, right? And I felt like, okay, how am I gonna synthesize these two different worlds and put them together in some way that feels productive for me? So I made up a class. <laughs> I called it body-mind literacy, and I decided this is based on the notion that the relationship between body and mind is a form of literacy that the university completely ignores and our educational institutions before that, too. Um, and then I encountered my first problem. I went to apply, it was an honors collegium class, and the list said, only ladder faculty may apply. And I was a lecturer. Now, in writing programs, we are all career lecturers. We don't have tenure in our department. For me, this ended up being a very positive thing. For me, tenure feels like a trap. I want full autonomy in my life, and I want to be able to operate in all different worlds. So, um, so I decided, you know, hell no, <laughs> I'm going to apply anyway. And then my thought was, they can reject me if they want, but I'm not going to not try just because someone made up that rule. <laughs> so I decided I'm going to apply. So uh, what happened eventually was I really had one wonderful woman on my side, Dr. Jennifer Wilson, who was the um, head of the honors program at UCLA, who just retired, amazing woman really believed in what I was doing. And sometimes that's all it takes, right? Is that one person to say, ah, oh, that's what she's doing. She should be doing this more. We need to support that. Um, by the way, as an aside, everybody I know who got a job got the job because they knew somebody who said, oh, he would be amazing at that, right? Or she would be perfect at that. And then they call you. So this networking thing, I, there's a lot to it. Um, but anyway, okay, so she really fought for me. A lot of the people on the committee did not want to accept that, that class, <laughs> um, but I got it. And um, so this, it's one of the things I, I'm gonna suggest to you first is look at what's missing in your world, and then where else can you supplement your education or your influences? And number two is don't follow the rules. I don't care what anybody else says. <laughs> Okay, so then I started to do this body-mind literacy class, best teaching experience of my life. Um, and I thought, well, how can I expand now on what I'm doing? Because I can't be the only one in the university who values the body and feels disconnected. Um, so I created this website that you see. Um, this is lauriemattinson.com. This is a total fantasy version of me. <laughs> and I created it so I get to put whatever I want on it. <laughs> um, and I love it. Um, there's stuff at the bottom of the site too, if you scroll down, but um, 
right now, you see that the main theme is trusting the body to teach the mind. And it took me a long time to come up with just that tag phrase, you know. Um, and there's, uh, there's all kinds of content on there. So the next thing I'm going to ask that you guys consider is your online presence, right? And not only thinking about what, how you're presenting yourself in a kind of polish, but also what are you offering to people? What, do you, what could you offer for free that people would say, ah, we want some of that where we are? So for me, I just put this out there, and that's when work started coming to me. I got a call from people at the Mother Company, which is an online site for parents. And they said, we, we saw your website, and we'd like you to write an article for us on raising confident children. And I said, um, do you know that I don't have children? <laughs> Now, I have children in my life because of my relationship, but I have not raised any children, nor do I plan to, ever. <laughs> okay, so um, she said, yeah, but we like what you did, and so would you be willing to do it? And I said, sure, why not, right? Because I'm the person who's willing to interview all the parents I know, and I'm also a teacher, so I know what it's like to raise confident students, right? I hope that doesn't sound condescending, but there's a part of us that does that. Uh, and so that was one, one way that the website led to other things. Another thing is I wrote this welcome letter for college freshmen. There's a section for students and educators there. And the most popular article on the site is called Are You Willing to Do the Work? And because of these two pieces, I also started getting invitations for other speaking engagements. And now um, I do represent the entire UCLA faculty every summer at orientation. So I speak to all 6,000 of our incoming students, um, 500 at a time. And guess what, you know? There's a lot of tenure track PhDs that they could have selected for that job, but they picked a lecturer in writing programs to represent the entire faculty, right? Well, why? Of course, because I work with freshmen my, my whole life. I've been teaching. I know how to talk to freshmen, you know? Um, so. You know, and by the way, I do use Google Analytics, which was mentioned earlier, which is kind of cool because I can track how people found my website and how long they stay on a page and whether they got there because of a referral or through Facebook. And by the way, Google Analytics is very easy to use, actually. So don't be intimidated when you hear that. Uh, you, you have them, you know, Google will send you updates monthly if you want or more. Uh, one of the things about, and we will get to our practices very soon, one of the things about academics that I tend to notice and just in my studies in psychology and so forth, um, or as a layperson, uh, is academics tend to be risk averse, right? We like stability as a group, not necessarily everyone. We tend to like stability, right? We like to cite sources, okay? We like to see what have people said about this before us <laughs> and how can we build on what's come before us? And I'm gonna ask you now instead to think of like an entrepreneur. You know, what if nobody else has done anything before you in this, in your category? Certainly no one else has, no one else has been you before, right? So in terms of just thinking in an entrepreneurial way, um, I will share with you one thing that I've done recently, which is I published a Kindle single on Amazon, and I bypassed the entire publication monster. I mean, not that Amazon itself isn't a monster, <laughs> but I put out there content that matched ex you know, my exact vision. This is exactly what I wanted to do. I hired an artist, I did the same artist who did the um, website images, and I wrote an ebook. and now every other month, Amazon sends me a check for people who are purchasing my Kindle single. So I just wanna say, you know, just in terms of the work that you are doing inside the academy, right now I'd, I would ask you to think about who are the other audiences that might be interested in this work? How could you maybe remove a little bit of the minute detail, right, and broaden it out for a larger audience. Um, you never know who's interested in that sort of thing. And this is, um, you know, for, for some of my colleagues, as soon as I said that, they said, what, Kindle single, self-publish, Amazon, no one will take you seriously. I don't care, I get money from Amazon every month. So I don't care how people judge it, it doesn't matter to me, right? So just look at whatever the hierarchy you have in your head about what's success and what's not. Um, and I've sort of eavesdropped on conversations around campus, and I, this is what I hear. I'm an Americanist. I'm a medievalist, right? I do Renaissance, I heard <laughs> earlier, okay? Now, these are extremely useful labels in our world, in one world, but can be really limiting elsewhere. So it also asks you to not only think of yourself in, in this kind of narrow way. Um, one more note, and then we'll move on to what I'm calling generative mindfulness. 
I, uh, I am on the hiring committee for our department, and I will tell you that the people who try to follow all the rules don't tend to get hired, right? The people who come to the interview and sit passively and answer our questions and write really boring but well-written letters <laughs> tend not to get hired. We want the person. We want you. We want your full personality, and we, want, we look at what are you offering to the interview? What kind of energy do you bring? What do you initiate in terms of the conversation? What questions do you ask us? Do you joke around with us, too? You know, we want colleagues that we want to hang out with. So who you are as a person is just as important as that, that letter and that CV or resume. Um, and so just a note about that. Okay, so now let's move on. Um, just in terms of generative mindfulness, I made up that phrase too. You can Google it, I don't know if it exists, <laughs> but I like to make up things. I'm kind of a do-it-yourself academic. Um, and it's, it's not so much mental health proper that I'm talking to you about today, but just taking notions of mindfulness and applying it to our project here, right? So, when we normally think about mindful exercise, the point is to just be present in the moment right now. But a lot of what we're doing here is planning for the future and trying to craft and create a future. Um, so I am not a monk, <laughs> obviously. I do not even pretend to teach you any sort of formal meditation. But I have a long history with meditative practice, more moving meditation than seated. Uh, and I, would, um, I hope that it, it does a few things for you. Number one, that it will boost a kind of cognitive flexibility in you. Now, if I tell you today we're gonna do some creative visualization exercises, I know some of you are gonna roll your eyes at me, right? But if I say, we're going to enhance your cognitive flexibility today, <laughs> more of you might get on board, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but if you do wanna check out, type in uh, creative visualization under psych info, which is a great database, you will see that they use this stuff for, let's say, musicians who want to perform on stage but have stage fright, and so they use these techniques with them and they're better able to do it. Um, or decreasing the level of pain in childbirth, and so you see that some of these exercises do actually decrease cortisol levels or adrenaline levels, right? So it is measurable for those of you who like evidence, okay? <laughs> um, so the next thing is really, just as we've been doing all day, I like to create um, and continue to generate a communal environment where insight is more likely to happen um, because mostly we do a lot of inner work alone or with our therapists, <laughs> right? Um, but doing it in community can be very powerful. And then finally, just the, the idea that you can create a vision for yourself um, that will find that you find satisfying and will drive you in some way. Um, and normally, as academics, I think we learn self-assessment. We're very good at self-assessment, and we also learn to assess others, which is a lot of judgment. This is more self-inquiry, just asking questions of the self, okay?